Right, I hope you can see me. Hello and welcome at a closer look at the Solomon Islands. My name is Simona Grano and I'm a senior lecturer and director of the Taiwan Studies Project at the University of Zurich. Now, A Closer Look is a series by the Asian Society Switzerland with support from BDO and the Institute of Asian and Oriental Studies at the University of Zurich. And in this series, as some of you may know, we shed light on Asian countries through the eyes of leading local voices. Today, we're looking at the Solomon Islands, a Pacific Island nation that has been in the world spotlight since one year, since it is being simultaneously courted by China and also by the United States and Australia, among others. In the coming hour, we will hear from two leading experts from the Solomon Islands. And in the last 15 minutes of our webinar, we will address all of your questions on the Solomon Islands. And let me remind you for the audience that you can submit these questions through the Q&A function on Zoom starting from now. And if you see a question that you really like, you can upvote it so that it has a bigger chance of being answered. So I will begin before I actually introduce our two speakers with some preliminary information on the Solomon Islands. Let's start with the first slide. So map and physical geography, as uh, some of you may know, the Solomon Islands is an island nation in the southwestern Pacific and is about three quarters the size of Switzerland and consists of six major islands and more than 900 smaller ones, more than half of which are actually inhab uninhabited. Some demographic facts about the Solomon Islands. Well, there are about 720,000 people living in the country and 95% of them are of Melanesian ethnicity. There are more or less 120 languages being spoken in this spread out island nation. Although English counts as the official language, not many people are really fluent in it and communication between different language speakers actually takes place using the so-called Solomon Pidgin, a hybrid of English and Melanesian words. Some economic facts, well, with a GDP per capita of around 2,200 US dollar, the Solomon's economy actually ranks near the bottom of countries in Oceania, ahead only of Kiribati. Solomon Islands economic size ranks 177th worldwide and the prognosis for growth is not that bright. Three quarters of the population are employed in agriculture and fishing and its main export is raw timber. Right, now the graph on export is quite interesting because it shows where most of the timber is being exported to. And this is also one of the reasons Solomon Islands is in the global spotlight. In fact, as you can see from the graph, in the past 20 years, the share of the country's export to China has increased from 12% to 64%. And export to Australia, which was long the biggest donor to the Solomons, more than halved, while export to countries like the UK, Japan or South Korea is falling off the map. The next slide is also a very interesting one, and again, a very clear example of how much China's presence in the Solomon Islands was able to expand before other countries started to pay attention. So if you look at this map, or sorry, slide, you actually see a building, and this building houses a bank, a service point for a DHL, and in the beige part on the far right, the US embassy, which by the, fa by the way, reopened only three weeks ago, I think on February the 1st, after having closed down in the early 1990s. On the next slide, however, you see the Embassy of China housed in its own complex, which also happens to be one of the biggest buildings in the entire country. We'll get into the difference between the presence of these two superpowers with our two guests soon. But before I introduce, do, sorry, introduce them, let me say something about the history very briefly of the Solomon Islands. So, the islands were first settled some 30,000 years ago and named after the biblical King Solomon by the Spanish, who arrived there in 1568 and hoped to find massive treasures. Over the next centuries, contact with European and Australian traders increased and many indigenous people were kidnapped to work sugarcane plantations in Australia and in other British territories in the region. This is referred to as black birding. In 1893, the Solomon Islands became a British colony. During World War II, the Allied forces actually fought fierce battles against the Japanese for the control of this part of the Pacific. And the waters around the Solomons are a testimony to this because they still contain the world's largest collection of World War II ship and plane wrecks. In 1978, 45 years ago, the country gained full independence from the United Kingdom. And to this day, though, the British monarch is still the titular head of the state. 
it has not been an easy path in these 45 years of independence for the Solomon Islands. The so-called tensions, five years of ethnic conflicts and violence between people from Guadalcanal and Malaita Islands brought the national government and the police to its knees and bankrupted the economy. So riots actually erupted again after the government decided in 2019 to switch its recognition from Taipei, ROC, Republic of China, to Beijing, People's Republic of China. And since then, Chinese money and assistance has been pouring in and people seem to start to notice, notice the improvements, uh, for example, in infrastructure building on the islands. On Malaita province, however, has actually kept its ties to Taipei ROC. But that could change now that quite recently, the local provincial leader has been ousted from power, actually, I think earlier this month. We'll talk about that with our two guests. So now let me come to the point where I finally introduce them and then we'll switch on the cameras, please. So first of all, Dorothy, Dorothy Wickham, welcome, is a highly experienced journalist and a trusted voice in the Pacific. She has been reporting from Solomon Islands for nearly 35 years and knows almost everyone on the ground and has an in-depth understanding of Pacific politics and culture. She's the founding editor of the Melanesia News Network. Her work also appears in the New York Times, The Guardian and other publications. So I cannot think of anyone better than you to talk about geopolitics with us today. Welcome, Dorothy. And the Thank second you. speaker, hi, is Jay Bartlett. He's a managing director at Hatanga LTD, a construction company based in the Solomon Islands capital of Honiara. He's also a board member at the Central Bank of the Solomon Islands and holds a position at the Solomon Islands Tertiary Skills and Education Authority. From 2014 to 2022, he chaired the country's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Welcome also to you, Jay. Right. So I'd say let's start with you, Dorothy and Jay both, if you want to both address, this is a very brief introductory question. Uh, Solomon Islands, you know, if we think about the Solomon Islands from Europe, is quite an unknown and exotic and far away destination. If I were to live from Zurich tonight, it would take me about 30 hours and three flights to get to Honiara, the capital. The country's head of state is the British monarch, but the last visit that the sovereign has made to the islands was 40 years ago. The nearest big city is Brisbane in Australia, which is 2000 kilometers away. So from our perspective, it feels very remote, but I would like to know for you, of course, since you're also remote from the rest of the world, how does that affect life for Solomon Islanders? Maybe Dorothy, would you like to go first? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, Simon, I think one of the biggest um, issues of being uh, remote and isolated uh, as we are, is that it's very expensive uh, to, to have basic um, services come uh, this far to the Solomon Islands. But, you know, with, with technology now and the internet, we don't feel so far away like we used to, maybe back in the 90s and 80s. I think you make a brilliant point, yeah. It has really shortened distances. Jay, would you like to add something to that or? Thank you, Simona, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, just to reflect on this question, um, you mentioned that, you know, it's, it's 2000 kilometers from Brisbane, which is roughly a three hour flight. And, you know, if you, if you step on a plane in Brisbane and you step off the plane in Honiara, um, you will see a big difference in terms of, uh, development and advancement. And I think that that large disparity and the lack of development kind of contributes to a feeling of uh, remote and uh, disconnect. Um, if you look at international flights uh, to the Solomon Islands, um, flights are expensive and there aren't that many flights like Dorothy mentioned. Being small and remote makes things expensive. So I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, Fiji, uh, one of our closest neighbor, gets a million tourists a year. Yeah. Um, Solomon Islands, which is you know very close, we only get 30,000 visitors a year. So you can see that Solomon Islands is not somewhere that a lot of people travel to. And it's definitely the road kind of less traveled. You know, being remote um, also makes us very dependent on food and fuel and imports. And it, it does give us a sense of vulnerability, I think. Um, especially this was amplified during COVID. Um, when we had the closure of international borders and we had delays in international shipping 
shipping uh, supply chains. You know, there are times during COVID, uh, during the lockdowns, when, you know, we run low on basic food essentials mm. like flour. And, you know, as, as Solomon Islanders and as Pacific Islanders, we're used to living off the land. So, you know, worst case scenario, we're still okay. Um, but, you know, it does give us a sense of how vulnerable we are. Now that borders are open, I think we feel, you know, we can travel a little bit more and there's that sense of freedom but, and less isolation. Thank you for that. Yeah, and thank you for pointing out also the difficulty of the logistics. I'm also familiar with that as I come from Venice. It's not really comparable to, of course, the Solomon Islands being that it is one of the most touristic city. But when it comes to logistic, being surrounded by the sea and the water is also not particularly easy. So you make it really, you made it a very good point, both of you. So Jay, let me uh, stick with you for a moment and ask you the next question. So the country's population of about 700,000 people is actually, as we said during the introduction, spread out over six main islands and dozens of smaller ones or hundreds of smaller ones, each of them using actually a, a separate version of these 120 indigenous languages that are spoken in the country. And of course, with different defining characteristics. So going from one island to the other can also take up to one week by boat. So my question for you would be, what kind of impact does this geographical division have on how people actually identify themselves? What I mean is, do they have a shared feeling of being Solomon Islanders or do they first and foremost actually identify with the islands that they are from rather than with the underlying or overlying umbrella nation? Yeah, so, so that's a really, I think, interesting question and interesting concept. And that's definitely something I, I feel that as a nation, we're still coming to terms with and, and that's our national identity. Um, I, would, I would probably characterize, characterize our national identity at the moment as weak. And this is, this is largely due to some of these factors that you've outlined. Um, we're geographically dispersed. We have different ethnic group within the islands and multiple languages. And this is even on, on the provincial level. So we'll have one island that will have multiple languages. So on, I think on a local level, um, on a domestic level, our identity is based primarily on our provincial group or our tribal group. And there is this lack of a national identity. And this, you know, this can present developmental challenges as well. You know, you see in societies with uh, weak national ident identities, you know, we have increased nepotism, um, there's a lack of trust. Uh, I, I think they refer to the radius of trust. There's a general lack of trust. And there's also hostility between different groups. And this can create kind of social issues. So we got, as you mentioned in, our, in your introduction, we had our independence in 1978. But that didn't really change our mindset from an ethnic one to a national one. You know, I'm still from Malaita before independence and after independence. I'm still from Malaita. And, you know, that national identity as a Solomon Islander is something that still needs to be worked on. It'll take time, it'll take policy, um, and it'll take education to develop this national identity and unity. And it's not something that I believe will happen organically as well. I think it's something that needs deliberate action and interventions. Right. Dorothy, do you want to add something to that? Or are you mostly agreeing and everything with, with what Jay said. Yeah, I totally agree with him. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, for for a country in the Pacific, I think we're the only one, uh, Jay, yeah, that we don't have a, a national dress that we identify as a Solomon Islands national dress. And I think that also is a problem in terms of how we identify ourselves when we, we, we travel as a, as a representative of our country mm -hmm. overseas. We, you'll you'll notice in, in in our uniforms when we go to attend games and we, we we tend to always go under the flag, not so much a traditional dress like you'd see with the other Pacific Island countries. So it it is a difficult thing. And like Jay said, I totally agree um, that education is the key, and this cannot just happen by itself. The government has to realize that it has to uh, take action and be really deliberate with. Uh, to drive this so that there's, there's a sense of nationalism and a sense of pride in being a Solomon Islander. The only time we call ourselves Solomon Islanders 
is when we travel overseas and we see each other and we go, oh, we're so many islands. But as soon as we arrive back in the country, we are, we are from Malaita, we're from the West, we're from Isabel and everywhere else. So yeah, it, 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 and, and um, 45 years, I think that's a bit too long. We, sh we should have got this right somewhere along the line already, I think, but we still uh, aren't nailing it. And I, uh, that's uh, something that I'll have to leave to the academics, I think. Right, so very briefly, because you just mentioned, that would have been my next question for you, Dorothy, the role of the government in this nation building process or project, right? Is there actually something that is going on at the level of the government in order to achieve more of a shared identity sense or not that much? For example, institutions like uh, the parliament, are they being strengthened? What is, what is going on? Is there something going on in this nation building process or not? Well, you know, as you had run through our history, we, we had the, what they call the tensions. And then, mm. of course, because of the tensions, we had foreign forces come in led by... by Tell Australia. us a little bit about those, maybe, for the, for the audience. Explain to us a little bit what caused this conflict between the different ethnic groups, if you don't mind. No, well, uh, the dispute was uh, over land mm. and uh, disrespect of uh, traditional lands and use of lands. It was a little complicated. People said it was politics. And, you know, with development, of course, land starts to get scarce, so people start to get a bit nervous about it and start getting territorial. And I think that's what happened to us during that period. And it sparked uh, the tensions between these two ethnic groupings. But when the Australians led in the regional assistance mission, which made up, was made up of all the countries in the Pacific, well, the forum countries, it was, it was the first of its kind for all the Pacific Island countries to converge into one and help this country solve its problem. As you know, before our problems, there was already the Bougainville crisis. There was no regional assistance mission or intervention into Bougainville. And so Solomon Islands was a, a, a special case. And, and, you know, people have said it's been, it was successful. It was successful that it stabilized the country. It got the government running again. And it, mm. it worked to try and strengthen the governance uh, structures of, of, of the government because our treasury, you know, needed, you know, to really um, security be uh, reinforced. The courts needed to feel that they were able to do their work, the police. So all these important um, institutions of the government uh, were able to function again uh, slowly. However, I, I really think that in our rush to get ourselves back uh, on our feet financially and economically, We've forgotten uh, the, the social, mm. social uh, aspects of our society, and I think this is where we're facing the problem now because we we have a very high youth population in Solomon Islands. Uh, uh, I think our popula youth population sits at around about seventy, between seventy to seventy-six percent of the ages between fifteen to thirty-five or forty-five, mm. around that 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 mark. So these are a lot of young, uh, young people who are not um, educated, uh, who have no job prospects, mm. and who don't, do not have a sense of uh, pride in, uh, in their country. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where we, we're starting to, right. you start to see the cracks now because of right, this right. social Right, and uh, we're also talking about these kind of issues, such as you know the bulging youth uh, population and uh, the level of education that they have. A bit later on in the webinar, but but let me then change a little bit the topic now and come to you, Jay, again. Um, this November, for for the audience, Solomon Islands will host the Pacific Games with about five thousand athletes from twenty four countries. This is the biggest sporting event that the country has ever hosted. And in a previous conversation with us, you actually said that we should compare. Uh, this to the impact that hosting the Olympics has on bigger countries, for instance. So what you meant, of course, is that these always come with a lot of new infrastructure and building projects, right? So can you tell us a little bit how and if these games are changing the face of Oniara and what kind of opportunities does hosting the Pacific Games actually bring for local companies, construction companies, but also for local people? Yeah, I, I did. I didn't mention that um, it's probably similar to an advanced nation hosting the Olympics uh, for us in Honiara. Um, 
I mean, I think broadly in terms of um, the timing, the games has been good. Um, and, and that's in a sense where it offers a, a focal point uh, for our development. And it gives us a time that um, things should be done. So we know in November this, this year, uh, we're going to be hosting um, the, the Pacific Games and showcasing our nation. And, and that gives us a, a sense of urgency about how we uh, go about our business every day. Um, in, in terms of the impact for uh, local construction companies, I would probably say that the impact is, is mixed. There's definitely a lot of construction happening in Honiara. So if you, if you travel to Honiara at the moment, um, that's definitely one thing that will, will hit you. And that's one thing that you'll, you'll notice is there's a lot of building and there's a lot of um, construction happening. But a lot of construction that is happening at the moment is, um, is bilateral aid. Um, and so these uh, type of projects generally go back to large contractors. Uh, they bring a lot of their own workers and they mobilize and build um, these big, big projects. Uh, so there's not much, I guess, that is shared into the local economy. We have uh, local construction workers, but a lot of them, in my opinion, are only providing uh, labor unskilled labor. And so there's minimum skills and knowledge transfer in this process. And, and, and I think we should probably look at the way that, you know, aid is delivered, especially for infrastructure. And it really should be multidimensional. So there should be benefit of the infrastructure itself that's built. Mm -hmm. That's something that we're really grateful for as a country. But we should also be in the process developing our our capability and capacity, you know. Otherwise, you know, it's a really a big missed opportunity. And I think one way that, you know, we can make this happen is through policy and legislation. Because if there's no policy or legislation to ensure that local contractors and the local economy is involved, it's left to best endeavors. And when it's left to best endeavors, it probably won't happen. And there has to be a deliberate framework that's put in place that ensure that these benefits are downstreamed. So, I mean, I think, you know, I think we'd like to see more happen in terms of the workflow into local businesses. Um, but I guess due to the nature of the funding and due to the scale of these projects, um, that hasn't been probably um, as much as we have liked. And as we're getting close to the games now, I think the government's just really focused on ensuring that the games are hosted successfully. So it's just all about making sure that things are delivered on time at the moment. Okay. Well, let's change a little bit then the subject and, and come to you again, Dorothy, and uh, allow me to just give a brief introduction for, for the public. So China, uh, we're coming to the subject of China that interests uh, all of us, of course, is quite busy as well in the run up to the games that we just talked about with Jay. It is actually building seven venues, including the National Stadium, which can hold up to 10,000 spectators. And we know that China's Huawei is also putting up cell towers, and more or less 160 ones of those, all throughout the Solomon Islands. And China is also financing the construction of a new wing at the country's main hospital and several more things that we can talk about with you, Dorothy, if you want. But that brings us to the reason why the Solomon Islands started making the headlines across the world namely what we hinted at during the introduction, China's increased activities in the country and the worry this creates in Australia, in the US and in their allied partners. Countries, for example, like Australia and the US were shocked in 2019 when the Solomon's minister, Prime Minister Sogavara announced that the country would no longer recognize Taiwan or ROC, its official name, but Beijing as the real China. And this immediately opened up the gates of Chinese aid and investment to the Solomon Islands, except for in one province, Malaita province, which we'll get to later and we mentioned a bit before. So the decision to switch allegiances from Taipei to Beijing actually baffled many in the West, especially when in May last year, Solomon Islands once again was in the spotlight because it signed a security deal with China, which could allow Beijing to station troops on the island and thus give China de facto a military foothold in the South Pacific. And now I come to the question for you, Dorothy. You wrote an article in the New York Times last summer and you wrote, 
the title was, can you blame us for turning to China? Can you tell us what you wrote in that piece? And maybe also what were your arguments regarding to the situation? Well, I was, I was um, reflecting on, on how uh, Solomon Aldis and maybe our leaders were thinking uh, at the time. Uh, as, as Jay had said, you know, this country, we, we've really struggled uh, mm -hmm. to get ourselves, you know, positioned amongst the other Pacific Island countries. And, and if you land here in Honiara, you'll see there's an absolute difference in the look, uh, even just uh, from the airport down into mm -hmm. Honiara, you'll see there's a big difference if you land in the other cities in the Pacific. And I think there's that sense of urgency I think that that's what I was trying to say in the article. There's a sense of urgency amongst our political leaders who wanted change, they wanted growth, and they wanted it fast. And they wanted it during their term while they're sitting in, in power. And also, like I said earlier, we have a huge youth population who were also getting impatient and, and saying, you know, the government wasn't doing anything. You know, our hospital is, is the same hospital we've had for the last... 20, 30 years, and our roads are the same. And, you know, so it, it's that, that sense of frustration, that same sense of feeling of being left behind, uh, I think was one of the driving keys uh, towards our, our government making that decision. Of course, there are other reasons why, but I, I'm, I'm talking about what was in the mindset of Solomon. As you know, Solomon Islanders were quite shocked when this switch happened because nobody was expecting it. We had mm. seen a signboard go up um, where the, the current uh, stadium is now that had a picture of a stadium with uh, the, the Taiwanese uh, flag on it and that said that the stadium that was going to be built there would be built by the Taiwanese. And then how many months later, it got pulled down and I was wondering, why is that thing gone down? And then suddenly we switched. And, and if you compare to what China is building now to what Taiwan was, was uh, intending to build, there's a big, huge difference in terms of size. Mm -hmm. um, and also now that you can sense there's a feeling on the ground here that things are happening, you know, the Japanese are fixing our roads. I mean, it's a really bad um, um, uh, uh, attitude to have that we're expecting um, always to be, to be fixed by our donors. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's not a good psyche, but that, that's what it is, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and my article, I was trying to say, this is what was going on before this mm. switch. And I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, I mean, Mr. Sogovare, he's been in power for quite a while now and he's going, he's, he's getting older. And I think he also has a sense of frustration in the way his the other donor partners are dealing with government and, and the way um, assistance is given to the Solomons. As you know, you know, we've had very deep, uh, very hard uh, times trying to even uh, get export out of this country. You, 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 you displayed the figures there. It's absolutely clear. It's very hard to get uh, export into Australia, even though we're only three hours flight away. Um, and so there's so many requirements. I mean, I understand that there's there are national issues for Australia itself in terms of quarantine and all this other stuff, but it's hard to explain, Simona. Sometimes I talk about this and I, I pause because I think now we're sounding like we're asking too much. Of, 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 uh, of our friends. But then, like I said, because of that, that's why we, were, we, uh, that's why we are now discussing China, basically. No, I think you did a good job in expressing the sense of frustration of being, uh, the feeling of being left, left alone, basically, right? To fend off for yourself among so many difficulties. <clears throat> we'll continue with this discussion on these topics later, but, but let me briefly come back to you, Jay. Uh, you were, until last year, the chairman of the National Chamber of Commerce. Can you tell me what's the impact on the Solomon, Solomon's business community and on, in general, Solomon Islanders of being wooed by multiple powers simultaneously? Do, do, just, do people actually profit or is it just more infrastructure building and just a few elite profiting? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think we need to probably just go back to um, COVID uh, and lead into this discussion because I guess when the borders closed and international borders closed, you know, our economy really took a big, uh, big hit. Um, like like many of the Pacific um, Islands, 
Uh, we all suffered. Uh, I guess uh, uh, everyone around the globe did. Um, I'm on the central bank, and our data showed that you know we had negative 3.4 percent growth in 2020. Mm -hmm. We came up to uh, negative 0.6 growth in 2021, and then we are uh, negative 3.7 percent growth in 2022. But in 2023, this year, we are forecasted to come up into positive 2.4 percent growth. And the, the reason we're coming out into positive growth, and our part of part of the reason is because of the infrastructure spend that is happening um, in our country. And so we, we've been quite fortunate that there's been a large pipeline of infrastructure uh, for the Solomon Islands. And this is not just um, this is not just bilateral aid. So not just geopolitical aid, this is multilateral aid as well. So we've got a big project like the Tina Hydro, uh, which is a renewable energy project um, that's happening at the moment. Uh, the Japanese, this is bilateral aid, are funding an international uh, airport upgrade that's due to open, I think, next month. And they're also upgrading the uh, East Honiara Road, phase two of Kukum Highway. So that's been happening as well. The a a Asian Development Bank, ADB, has funded a university upgrade. And plus we've got all the uh, Pacific Games facilities, uh, which is funded by China. And then we've also got our local state-owned enterprises, our water authority and our power authority and our ports authority, all also spending money on capital infrastructure. So this infrastructure spend has really, I guess, helped us all indirectly by kind of helping the economy recover. Um, there's, there's also definitely a number of factors of why the equity is to ensure that the money that's spent in the economy on aid, you know, comes back down into local businesses. And a lot of it is spent in the local economy as well, as much as we can. Um, you know, we've got uh, our traditional partners like Australia. Uh, they've also got their own infrastructure program, the Solomon Islands Infrastructure Program, SIP. Yeah. And that's a 10-year program um, that's kicked off. And, you know, they've, they've promised that a lot of this funding will go into the local economy through local contractors. So I don't think there's real direct benefit at the moment, but I think over time we should be able to see this create more long-term economic growth and then hopefully that in turn improves the livelihood of our people yeah so we'll we'll, we'll wait for the ripple effects you mean that we'll see maybe in the near future dorothy um let's change a little bit the subject and talk about something that is also very often uh, in the media or under the media spotlight concerning not just the solomon islands but in general pacific nations global warming so we know that sea levels around Solomon Islands are the fastest rising on Earth, and Calais Island, part of the Solomon Islands, is one of the first islands in the world to actually disappear because of climate change. It is now completely underwater, and last year, when the BBC interviewed a young woman from the island, what she said, and I quote her, our country doesn't contribute that much to the emission of greenhouse gases and global warming, and yet we are the ones facing the destruction arising from it. This is something that people from Western countries did to us. We are facing the consequences of what others have done. So my question for you would be, what are the real on top of the entire island being submerged, but what are some of the concrete um, on the grounds effect that you notice from this and how are the people dealing with it, but also what is the government doing to address these issues? Uh, I think, I, I think um, you know, in terms of uh, global warming and sea level rise, yes, we we have islands um, um, being uh, you know water being uh, rising in them some of them and one of them as you said had already disappeared, but I I think one of the issues that I I think that we have here, and and I'm gonna take it from this angle I don't know how how Jay would look at it, is there are only a few of us educated people who know what the issues are and. The, the cause and effects uh, later on for us in the future. But I think a lot of, I, I'd say about 70% or 60% of, of ordinary Solomon Islanders who are living out there uh, are not really focusing on it because to them, um, they've watched it slowly rise up. They've adjusted to it. They, you know, they've, they've, they've uh, tried to ensure that they've moved to higher ground with their gardening. They've changed their water sources. 
So, so, so they've adjusted or they've adapted uh, uh, to, to what's happened. But the, the, the clear understanding of why and the politics of it and the, the international debate on it, that is very much lacking on the ground amongst ordinary Solomon Islanders. And I think this also is a problem for us because um, I'll go back to what Jay was saying about all the infrastructure being built, you know, and what are we going and we'll have to wait to see what would be the benefits that would, would um, come out of all these improvements. But I, I, I keep saying this, and I've been saying this for the last 10 years, if we do not improve education levels, if we do not improve education levels in this country, then we are totally going to be left behind. And this is our biggest problem in this country, is that we really need to make education compulsory, and we really need to raise the basic uh, level of education for us to be able to to debate, to discuss, and 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 plan for the future in terms of when we talk uh, global warming, when we're talking um, the economy, when we when we're looking at the geopolitical issues of this country, there's only a few people talking, and like you said, two percent are fluent in English. Isn't that representative of how many people are educated uh, at to that level that are able to to maybe discuss? Mm -hmm. um, issues like maybe Jay and I and, and other people like uh, Gladys who, who, who spoke about her, her grandparents' island uh, disappearing. So, uh, I mean, the, this, this is the fundamental issue. I really feel strongly about this, that education is the key. Now, if we want to change anything, whether it's to do with global warming and our choices in politics, our development issues, our economy, it has to come back down to education. So I don't think that that's an important thing for Solomon Islanders who are living in the rural areas, mm. who are going to gardens every day and have to live the life that they live currently right now at this moment. And is there something, it's a bit of a detour, but going on in the education sector from the government at the moment? I mean, these are things that you as educated people are realizing, but is the government agreeing with you and doing anything or not that much so far? Yeah, well, that's it. You know, I, I, I would have really loved to see the millions of dollars being poured into these Pacific Games, being poured into our education mm. uh, infrastructure and, and development. But of course, you know, we voted our leaders in. They are the ones who are, who are ruling. They are the ones who are making the decisions. And they, they chose Pacific Games. And the argument was at that time that Solomon Islands needed something big uh, 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 to maybe bring us together. And so this was an event that would bring us Solomon Islands together as a nation, and also that it would stimulate, uh, um, you know, the economy and bring mm -hmm. much needed infrastructure in terms of, like I had said, social component mm -hmm. of society, which was sport. And that we had really lost over the last maybe 15 years because of, of uh, going through the tensions. Right. Uh, this is an extremely important, as you say, as you mentioned, issue. And I mean, 2% of the people speaking English doesn't really also help the, the internationalization of, of the problems, absolutely. Let's continue a bit in the same direction with the Chinese uh, factor. And then the next question is actually for you before then we open to, to, to the audience questions. Jay, this question is for you. So there have been several multiple occasions in the past in which the Chinese community locally was targeted in violent unrest. For example, in 2006, uh, much of Honiara's Chinatown was destroyed after allegations surfaced that the prime minister had used money from Chinese business people to bribe members of the parliament and that large sums of money uh, were being funneled to China. Beijing evacuated citizens from the Solomons back then and three years later um, and uh, 13 years later in 2019, after the Solomon switch from uh, Taipei to Beijing, Chinatown was looted again. So in November 2021, Chinese settlers who own many of the small retail outlets in Honiara were again the targets of rioters. So my question for you would be, what is behind is, is there, we always talk about Chinese influence in the scale of, uh, you know, global geopolitics, security issues and influence on the country. But is there also on the grounds at the level of the population resentments uh, targeted against Chinese presence on the islands or, or how would you see this? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think to be honest, there's probably a, a you know a few underlying issues that um, contribute 
you know, to the, the unrest. And just like any issue, it's, you know, it's, it's quite complex. Um, I guess everyone will have their own uh, opinions depending on, you know, the narrative that they want. But I guess there are a few fundamentals for me that are really important when we discuss this. And, you know, and one of these things, you know, Dorothy has shared and, you know, me myself as a young Solomon Islander, which, you know, I, I have concern about is, is the population. We have, you know, 70% under 30, and that's a very, very large youth bulge. And if you look at unemployment around the country, you know, you've got a young population and you've got high unemployment and th there is a lack, lack of data, but if we use your contributions as a active contributor to your superannuation as a, as a metrics, the 60,000 people contributing actively every month to their superannuation. So that's some measure of formal employment out of a population of, you know, 700 plus thousand is, is not a lot of formal employment. So we've got a, a fast growing population and we've got large unemployment and, you know, it can go two ways. We can have a demographic dividend if we utilize this population properly and we're able to create jobs, it's a good thing. We can, you know, we can drive economic growth with our young population. But if we don't have uh, jobs and opportunities, then what we have is a demographic time bomb. And I think what we see every now and then happening is this time bomb just letting off a little bit of steam. And so we also have growing inequality, income inequality. You know, we have a foreign minority. Yes, we have a, a Chinese population in the Solomon Islands and they dominate the, the retail business front. There is going to be growing resentment regardless of the race. I think there is going to be growing resentment. And we have also local businessmen, Chinese businessmen, you know, sometimes that take advantage of weak institutions and that just furthers this resentment. So, you know, there is probably a number of factors that contribute to social instability and unrest. But when you have a dry box of firewood, you know, any spark can, can, can light start it. the fire. And yeah. geopolitics is just... I missed the last part of your question. I think there was a slight uh, glitch with the internet connection there, but I'm soon going to open up the floor for the questions from the audience, but um, let me ask one last question to you, Dorothy, before we do that. So you've been working as a journalist in the Solomon Islands and of course elsewhere in the Pacific, as we said before, for over 35 years. And last year you wrote in The Guardian, I've never seen the secrecy of the last few months. Um, plus the prime minister's decision to postpone national elections to sometime next year doesn't really quite have, at least in, in Western country, a democratic ring to it. And the opposition also has accused the prime minister of power grab. So my question for you would be, how safe do we need to interpret civil liberties at the moment and, and democracy in, in the country? Uh, how do Solomon Islanders like yourself see this shift? Well, um, for one thing, um, despite the fact that I've said that, uh, I think what I meant at the time was uh, government uh, institutions were not opening its doors. Uh, to answer questions or even to have a discussion or a debate um, within, you know, especially in, in, in the mainstream media platforms. But if you go on to, you know, social media platforms, government is being hammered nearly every day. And, you know, they, it, it gets so personal, it, it, it sometimes get, becomes a bit dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the reasons why I have always advocated for government to, to, Put out its hand and, and talk to talk to the media, because we 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 are a, 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 an institution that also needs to have rules and guidelines to to uh, do our work. But I I also must also admit here that there were some mistakes made by our our, our media itself here that angered the government in terms of um, not balancing our stories and getting inaccurate information out, and this has caused. A, a huge uh, distrust between the media and the government, the current government that's sitting now. And and also it was made worse when the security pact was signed 
and then the, the foreign press jumped into the whole mix and, and um, really angered the government uh, in terms of the, um, the way they were approaching our politicians when they arrived in Honiara and even uh, some of the things that they were doing as journalists. So as a result, the local media have been left as victims out of this whole, whole situation. But I am hoping, I'm hoping that in time government will understand that they, they need us here. They need us because despite whatever we say and we do and whether China's here or not, or China's building huge infrastructure, pouring huge money to this country, this country is a democratic country. That's the basic baseline. Mm. And, and, and China must also realize that if they have, they, were, they, if they have to deal with us and deal with us properly, then they, they, go, they have to understand that, that our, our institutions uh, must be protected. And the government that sits in power now that they are friends with uh, uh, was elected in. What if tomorrow the people change their mind because mm -hmm. of frustrations about what government's doing? then it'll change the whole picture again. Yeah, well, let me remain with this topic of this deal between, you know, you being a democracy and China being an autocracy and the influence that China has on the Solomon Islands. There is now a question I want to start addressing. I have so many more questions on my side, but that would be mean to misuse my time. So I will address one question for the audience, which goes in this direction. Uh, this person asks uh, and mentions that China is, of course, as we know, not only providing infrastructure to the Solomon Islands, but also armament, for example, for the local police forces, right, mainly for riot control. So how does the local population interpret this? Does, does it think that it is making the situation safer in case of future riots? Or are there actually worries that this could actually add fuel to the situation? Whoever wants to go first. Um, I'll, 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 I'll answer this briefly. I mean, I, I think it's probably a combination of both. I think it might add fuel um, mm -hmm. to the fire. And at the same time, you know, it, it is about trying to kind of manage these social situations that uh, get out of hand uh, every now and then. So um, I guess it's, it's hard to know the intention yeah. uh, behind that, uh, but certainly, you know, security has become more front and center, uh, a concern about the government, um, especially in making decisions that are not always popular. And so, you know, you, it, they could be preparing for uh, some of these decisions that have been made. Okay, All right. Well, the one question that it's mostly about, it's also about geopolitics. I don't know if you feel comfortable, either of you answering it. Uh, it's about Bougainville, an island of the Solomon Island archipelago, but that is politically part of Papua New Guinea. And the question is, did the island has voted in 2019 for independence, whether you think it is con conceivable that Bougainville would seek a union with the Solomon Islands or not? Uh, Dorothy, would you like to try or do any of you feel that you are up for, for this question? I or think not. They, they, they are wanting independence. I don't think they will be looking to go and, 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 and join up with another country again. So I think that would be my answer uh, to that question. Okay. okay. Um, another question actually covers the role of Australia, right? And it asks um, that whether you think that Australia could or not in the future recover its influential role that it had in the past and help rebalance the Chinese influence, or is it too little too late at this moment? Um, I, th I think I think Australia has uh, will always have a big role to play, uh, purely because of I guess the geography um, yeah. of Australia and New Zealand um, in the Pacific. Um, they're they're our biggest clo closest uh, markets. Um, so if we can see better economic integration, like yeah. Dorothy has raised, um, if you know the Australian markets can open up for business. Uh, for our exports, uh, if we can see uh, ease of travel. Um, right now, with a Solomon Island passport, I can come to the EU and get three months, which we're very grateful for. Um, but, you know, some of our closest countries, it's, it's quite challenging uh, to travel to. Um, so I think Australia is well aware of this. Um, they've recently taken more than 5,000 
uh, workers from the Solomon Islands working uh, in seasonal working here in Australia. And, you know, that's contributing a lot to our uh, GDP uh, in terms of remittances. So um, all of these things make a big difference. Right. And um, there's a question now that allows me to address something that I think was originally meant for you, Dorothy. We didn't talk about the fact that one province uh, uh, or rather one Malaita Island still recognizes Taipei, right? So the question from the audience, and maybe we can address a bit this peculiar situation, is um, Solomon Islands, like other Pacific Island states, keep on switching recognition. I think in this case, you didn't switch recognition, but it was back in 2019 and one province maintained relations with Taipei. But anyway, the question goes, is this because of dollar diplomacy, principal diplomacy, or political grandstanding in domestic politics? How do you characterize the motive? This is a real question behind this switching. That's a tough one, Simona. Um, <laughs> I think it's a little bit of everything. <laughs> I, I would say it's a little bit of everything. I, I think also, um, mm, Malaita is a province that 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 is um, is very different in the way it approaches uh, uh, national politics. I think. Uh, their people think differently from, mm. from other provinces. Um, the political leadership in Malaita, mm, that's questionable about how they're approaching the issue and whether it is going to be doing any good for their people and whether they're actually doing any good at all, taking the positions that they're taking, whether it's pro-Taiwan or it's pro-another mm. country. Um, but I, I think uh, if you really look at it, there's a lot of Malaitans out there that don't really understand <laughs> what this whole argument is about. Mm -hmm. And this relates back to what I had said earlier. Like, when you start talking geopolitics and then people are going, so what's that? How does that affect me? Got to do with so, me. Exactly. How does it affect my, my, my food, my shelter, my, mm -hmm. my, my access to clinics? my um, access to a good education for my child. How, how does this all affect me? So it's a very difficult um, issue for you to debate with an ordinary Solomon Islander. I've seen foreign journalists come here and they ask Solomon Islanders on the street, <laughs> things like, um, so what do you think of, you know, the fact that Chinese are here and they're building a huge stadium. And then the, the Solomon Islander goes blank mm -hmm. for a minute because he's not really thinking about it. And it all comes down to what I said. Uh, that uh, we really need to raise the level of education so that we, we make educated choices and we are more aware of the issues around us. So that's that's basically how I see it. Right. Well, I, I think you make a very good point and I want to stick a little bit with this question of uh, with this topic of education um, because there's a question from the audience, but also it would have been one of the questions I would have asked you, especially you, Jay, uh, because you studied, for example, for your tertiary, for the university uh, degree in Australia, right? So, so the question from the audience is actually, you said that education should be made more um, well, compulsory, at least uh, widespread. Is there no minimum required at all? This is what the question asked. Does that mean investments in education must urgently uh, address uh, at lower levels of schooling, especially in remote areas? Well, can teachers be better trained? Can you tell us a little bit what the problems with this are in the Solomon Islands? Yeah, so uh, there's, a, there's a fact, well, not a fact, that a, a stat that um, I, I hear quite often, and it's um, in, in the Solomons, a classroom is born every day. So there's roughly 30 to 40 children that are born every day and and that in itself is not an issue but it is an issue if you're not building one or two classrooms every day and mm -hmm. i think structurally we have not invested in the last 30 years in the infrastructure we need to cater for this population explosion that we're seeing now right. we, we certainly haven't been building one or two classrooms for the last decade as far as i know and so we have a large number of young children and we don't have enough schools i think that's probably you know, quite uh, one of the obvious ones in terms of access to education. Um, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to, to study in Australia, um, ended up working in construction, even though I studied marine biology. And a lot of our st students are funded to study when they go for tertiary education to the University of the South Pacific um, in Fiji. Uh, we also have Australia <laughs> awards 
which funds uh, postgraduate and under, undergraduate students in Australia. And mm -hmm. we have Shevning students, uh, which is the UK government uh, funding students into the UK. But these are very, very small minority. I think we need, you know, uh, better access to education just in general and better quality um, education in general. And we're still uh, using the road system. So we really need education reform. So we move to an inquiry-based system so that yeah. people are problem solving, critical thinking, mm -hmm. all of these things, as opposed to just rote learning. Parity, yeah, yeah. Okay, one last question for the audience, and then I will ask you one more question. Um, so this question says, there's a regional structure among Melanesian island states. Could this be made more efficient, for example, in topics like the defense of common interests, like um, security interests, national security interests, relations with China, despite the tensions that there are among different Melanesian island states? Is there something you see as feasible? Is there a discussion going on regarding this? I'll take a shot at that one. Uh, I think, um, well, everybody says Melanesia, they see us mm. as being uh, the same. We, we are really not. And I think one of the things that would answer your question is, uh, just by looking at the Melanesian Spearhead Group uh, organization, you could see that it, it has taken a back seat over the last few years to, to um, the regional bodies like um, the Forum, uh, SPC, SPREP, and even FFA. Now, this is because Melanesia, uh, which is Papua New Guinea, Fiji, Vanuatu, Solomon, and of course, you, you know, Kanaki, New Caledonia as observers, mm -hmm. but it, 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 we have so much uh, differences in terms of how we view our neighbors. Um, you know, while we're talking China, we also have to look at the issue of Indonesia in, in Melanesia, because Indonesia shares a territory with Papua New Guinea. And mm -hmm. then we're looking at, the, at, the, and, at the, the French influence when you're talking about Vanuatu. And then uh, Fiji has a whole different... Um, approach to its its relationship with, with the international community for its own needs. So when we start looking at Melanesia as a block, mm. I think it's it's a difficult one to, mm -hmm. to hold together. And I think MSG is a is a perfect example of, of the fact that it's difficult. Yeah. Well, no, thank you. That makes sense. Also, being so widespread, uh, as you said before, also doesn't help uh, the, the co collision between different places. Um, we are unfortunately nearing the end of our webinar, but I have one short questions for both of you. And I, and I would, like, uh, would like to ask you to be a bit brief about this. And um, this is about the next episode of A Closer Look, which will take place on March 9 at noon, just like today. And it will be on Nepal, um, a country that also does not really feature prominently in Europe yet. Um, how is Nepal seen in the Solomons? Are there any thoughts that come to your mind uh, when you think about this Himalayan nation? If not, um, that's also okay as an answer, but maybe something comes to mind. Well, I, I've read a little bit about Nepal, mm -hmm. and I think it's a country that is isolated amongst huge countries. That, that's just my perception of it. Right. And also struggling with the changes in the world today. Mm -hmm. What about you, Jay? I, I was fortunate enough to be on the other side of the border in Tibet. Mm -hmm. And at the time there was there, there was an earthquake. And so, you know, when I think about Nepal, I think about some of the unfortunate events that have happened. And mm -hmm. it also reminds me of what's happening at the moment in, you know, in Syria and Turkey. So I, I get those sort of images. Yeah. Well, then I would uh, say to both of you, but also to the audience, that you should join us in two weeks to learn more for a closer look at Nepal. And if you haven't already done that, please go to asiasociety.org slash Switzerland. Click on the event and register for it. Now, today I want to just say to the both of you, um, joining us from Brisbane, Jay, and of course from Honiara, Dorothy, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your unique perspectives on the Solomon Islands with all of us today. It was a pleasure to have you here as guests. And thank you, of course, also for the audience, for your great questions and for joining us. Uh, we will see you again soon, hopefully in two weeks. <laughs>